All right, so welcome everyone. We're starting in a minute. Just uh, take your seats and we'll be ready to go. There are a few seats uh, there on the right, high, high chairs. All right, great. So we're just two minutes late, which is uh, quite record breaking, as well as the, the attendance numbers, uh, which we're also really happy about, uh, even though it's summer. It's surprising how much people actually hungry for uh, learning new JavaScript stuff. Uh, so welcome to Hot Summer Edition. Um, it's really hot, uh, as you probably noticed. Uh, not plus 35, happily, but uh, still quite hot, especially in Amsterdam with all this humid air. But again, uh, really happy uh, to have you all here. Uh, we really try to get really great speakers uh, today and get a good lineup so we convince people not chill out on, on the beach today and go instead and have some fun time with us and uh, get some uh, learning. Uh, so my name is Robert. Um, I haven't been opening Amsterdam GS uh, for a while. Previously, Tim, um, who stepped down for a while from co-organizing, been doing that. Uh, but the run, uh, been running basically this meetup um, behind the stage, doing live streaming, doing speaker lineups and uh, emails. You probably saw me in um, in uh, yeah in your mailbox. Uh, I also run React Amsterdam, uh, Lead Dev Amsterdam. That's the meetup I've been starting, and then uh, pass it forward to other people as well. So quite a bunch of meetups, and um, luckily enough, uh, JS Amsterdam JS is one of the biggest, therefore also the more the most favorite, as JavaScript is the foundation for everything. Um, so we live stream today, um, so we tend to live stream all our uh, events uh, and if you uh, want, want to rewatch some of the talks from previous um, editions, you can always see either the live stream completely, either the separate edits, so we basically then uh, edit the talks and uh, publish them separately on, on the same name channel, so if you'll just Google Amsterdam GS YouTube, you'll find us for sure. Um, thanks to uh, our partners, um, uh, Reactor and a few more that I'll mention later. Uh, we have really nice uh, venue today. Uh, Crea so far been like the best choice we had for the meetup. Uh, it's it's play it's uh, have enough space for all of us. It has a really nice bar which is open till like midnight I think. So we can always hang out after the talks, which we highly encourage. So meetups are not only about talks. Uh, or me giving uh, some wise words from the stage, but also about networking. So uh, since we don't reserve time for questions after talks, um, please do catch speakers after the talks, um, like buy them coffee or beer or whatever you prefer. So uh, yeah, thanks for our sponsors. We have nice budget for drinks, foods. Uh, so we're all uh, fat and uh, ready for the talks. So thanks to Reactor who supports us for the second time. Uh, it's a global company that recently, well, a year ago opened an office in Amsterdam. It's quite a global uh, web shop, like not your average consultancy. Uh, they do really great uh, stuff. Uh, there are two people from Reactor around here as well, so uh, I think you can find them um, in the crowd. Uh, then we have Evolution Gaming supporting us for more than a year already. Uh, they also are a global company. They're doing uh, 3D uh, WebGL uh, games using React and, and WebGL, obviously. And they also have uh, a branch here, quite a big one in Amsterdam, uh, also being originated in, in a bunch of other cities. And another small one, uh, which is uh, basically uh, my side project, won't tell much about it, but if you're upset with uh, the way how recruiters treat you and you want some change, just uh, give it a try, uh, have a look. Uh, another small news, um, we've been like um, competing on numbers with some other local meetups and uh, just recently I found that we actually again became the, uh, the biggest JavaScript front-end created um, uh, meetup group in area or in Netherlands. Uh, probably top something like in Europe as there's not much that big groups in general. So a uh, big shout out to all of you. Um, it's really great to have you without um, such attendance. Uh, we would burn out like really fast and the meetup is basically on since like seven years. It's, it's really like one of the oldest I think even as well. Uh, so if you're uh, just like joined the community, uh, you may haven't heard that we also run uh, conferences. So we have meetups, we run them quarterly. We try to make them as small conferences so you can see around how much people are here today. Uh, but we also do have an annual conference, uh, which happens like early, early summer. Uh, so last one was June 1st, and the next one we'll repeat. So we do it annually. So you can always count on us that there will be always a good JavaScript conference in town. 
we have quite a bunch of good speakers. Uh, we'll announce uh, new soon. Uh, actually, uh, Fatih, uh, who's also on slides, uh, will be speaking today about GitLab frontend uh, to uh, complement his previous talk on the conference. Also, we have Douglas Crawford. Uh, next time, we'll surprise you with uh, some more uh, really familiar faces. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be announcing like uh, really early bird tickets. I think on next Amsterdam GS, we have a tradition to launch tickets and dates like and at the meetups. So just visit our meetups and you'll get the best deal. Um, we do also a bunch of other events. Um, so if you're into React, we also do React Amsterdam and React Day Berlin, uh, which is quite soon at November at the end of November. Bunch of great speakers. If you're into React, you probably know Ken Wheeler, uh, the craziest open source guy on Twitter. Um, and uh, if you want to speak, you may uh, get really nice uh, art basically done uh, ex exclusively for you. So we experiment with some presents for speakers. And for the last few conferences, we've been uh, getting uh, cool artists to do like avatars and drawn avatars. And this time we're trying something new, it's like steampunk style. Um, every speaker, MMC and uh, lightning talk speakers will get custom drawn avatars, which is super cool in, in the sharing the vibe of the whole conference. So uh, not only for conferences, uh, but also for meetups, we need you uh, as speakers, as helpers, if you want to help with organization of meetup conference or other meetup like React meetup, just uh, grab me, I'll be here till late um, for speaking. Starting from meetup is a really good opportunity to just kick off your public speaking skills. We'll have people to help you uh, rehearsing. So don't be afraid, you can start with five minute talk. We're open to uh, lots of different formats for five, 10, 30 minute, minute talks, whatever uh, you have to content about, uh, we'll provide you with everything you need and support. So yeah, that's about that. Um, one last thing, um, of course, our company is hiring as every are, uh, but if you're looking uh, for a remote job, and uh, this is uh, the company that actually hires like full-time remote and not contractors, but really internal employees with l gatherings like once in a quarter and uh, more often, uh, remote jobs are available there. Just Google Hostmaker and you'll find it. And if you uh, want to relocate and like, let's say, uh, get some new experience in London, it's also a good opportunity to start. So um, that's it with the opening. Uh, then we'll proceed basically with the lineup. So we'll have three awesome talks. Um, Rachel will start straight after me. Then we'll have a talk from Andre who traveled from uh, Berlin. So we have uh, international uh, crowd here on the stage, which is also really great. That's what we will always strive for, to make this meetup really international and uh, global. And then we'll have a really short break, just like 10 minutes. Uh, if you go out for drinks, just be sure to be back in 10 minutes uh, so we can uh, continue with the agenda, where Fatih will talk about GitLab, uh, frontend at GitLab, which is very no well-known uh, project, obviously, especially after the uh, situation with GitHub. Um, one rant about it. Although I like Microsoft, so um, if you use VS Code, you probably also should like Microsoft. Nothing better on that. And yeah, of course, follow us everywhere um, so you won't miss any next events, I'll talk recordings so we can share them with friends and things like that. And yeah, so we'll now have a minute to connect Rachel and uh, so forth. So, uh, you know, welcome Rachel as our. Okay. Ah, I think I can hear myself speaking now. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And of course, I left my clicker somewhere, not here. No, I didn't put it underneath. Yeah, let's find out. Oh, it totally is the right one. Sweet. Okay, all right. Hey, great crowd. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm curious, before we get started, uh, who here is excited about animation? Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. You already have this. Um, now we're going. We're going to get really. We're going to uh, narrow down this group of people. How many of you are into CSS animation, JavaScript animation? Got any GSAP addicts in the house? Oh well. Hello. Thanks for coming. 
I'm actually, I'm, I'm disappointed. GSAP is like the thing. Uh, anybody personally identify as a motion designer in the audience? Okay, the motion designers did not get the memo about tonight. I'm so sad. But good to know, good to know. Sweetness. Moving along, you may know me from awesome projects like devtoolschallenger.com, which shows off Firefox's really cool animation tools. I've helped clients build motion design into their user interfaces and their design systems at scale. Kind of an animation wonk if you haven't noticed the themes so much so that I even wrote a book with a book apart. I do have copies for sale with me tonight if you buy me beers. <coughs> and I've worked for Microsoft Edge, I've worked with Firefox, I've worked with the W3C for a long time. I'm a Google developer expert and I just moved to Amsterdam to work for these people because you know, only big companies need animation experts. Uh, so you're stuck with me, congratulations. But before all this, I used to be a professional cartoonist and I made web comics for teen girls uh, for a living around the world uh, from the middle of nowhere in Virginia in the United States. Small town, you probably never heard of it. Uh, eventually, I had to be an adult and get a real job making websites, of course. I thought I'd turned my back on art and creativity and storytelling, and that I would never tell stories again. In the meantime, I was learning a lot about all these cool new uh, APIs that were coming out. And I remembered this guy here, Scott uh, McLeod. He's my favorite author. Um, he wrote a great book called Understanding Comics and another one called Reinventing Comics, which is even better than Understanding Comics. Okay, once again, have you read Understanding Comics? Anybody? Anybody? That's your homework. Go home and read Understanding Comics. It's like the book that you should read if you're designing anything for anyone. But he also wrote another book called Reinventing Comics, which was all about how to use what the, the visions of the future where people would be able to draw comics on tablets in their hands and there'd be this thing called micropayments and, well, his, his things keep coming true little by little in weird ways. So it's a great set of books to read. So I saw these APIs coming out, you know, like web audio and speech recognition and CSS animations and I was like, my God, he was right. The internet is an infinite canvas. Uh, so I did this project with Adobe Inspire called Alice in Videoland, and I don't mean the Swedish Electro Clash band, although I totally love them. Uh, this is the Alice in Videoland I'm talking about, and it introduced a lot of designers to the idea that they could code to create interactive stories at a time when Flash was decidedly uncool. So that was just a video. You could have used After Effects to make that, just recorded it and posted it somewhere. The CSS animations are very declarative. They're not very interactive. Interactive animation tends to need libraries like GreenSock or SnapSVG or Mo.js or other libraries that don't provide logos on their GitHub pages. That's why you're not listed here. <laughs> <coughs> Still, uh, it's very tough because browsers weren't designed for animations other than say, scrolling. Um, their rendering engines are not the same rendering engines you'd get with like say, uh, a game. Uh, we've been missing out since the death of Flash, but all of that has been changing as browsers have been upping the rendering engine game. All right, so let's do a little history lesson here. Before CSS animations or transitions, over a decade ago, there was something called synchronized multimedia integration language, uh, or we know it as smile. You can remember it's pronounced smile, like the facial smile. Uh, it's used to S uh, animate SVGs, and it was created by that slow process known as standards committees. So it was born in 1999, the good old days. <coughs> so, 10 years later, 2009, nothing much has happened with standardized animations on the web, right? In the meantime, uh, this thing called the iPhone is on the, on the docket over at Apple. And it has a browser, and its developers, the Safari developers, they're thinking, how can we make the Apple website look as awesome in our browser, uh, even though it doesn't support Flash as it does on desktop? What can we do? And they introduced the CSS animations and transition standards. They didn't run them past anybody. They just kind of like swooped into the W3C and was like, I, I've got some, some standards for you, goodbye. And they, they ran away. And of course, you can imagine that all the other browsers we're very happy that now they didn't just have one animation engine to contend with, they had three that they had to support. 
So Internet Explorer, at that time, still, still something of an impactful browser in the world, was like, oh, hold on, hold on. Three animation engines, you're kidding me. I can't possibly do that. No, no, no. Give me an API that I can use to describe the animations of all of these. One API to rule them all, an API that could underlie all the browser's animations while letting JavaScript developers access that animation engine. It was a really big API. <laughs> After several years of drafting, uh, by that process known as standards committees. Uh, spec authors are finally nailing it down. It hasn't been changing too much in previous years, uh, but we now know it as the Web Animations API. Hooray! Unfortunately, Chrome opted to deprecate Smile back in 2015, so it's kind of, sort of dead, not really. Um, but, you know, like, good effort. Thank you for coming along. Uh, <laughs> So we still have at least two of those engines. Um, the Web Animations API is still a big deal for browsers and animation. Uh, you can already see it at work in browsers animation development tools. For instance, these awesome tools that uh, you can see, you've got timeline scrubbing, just like in the old Flash days uh, on Firefox developer tools. I'm a big fan of Mozilla and their products, um, which is why I teamed up with MDN uh, to document this API yeah, I love him so much. And I thought, who better to help me tell this story than Alice? So I brought her back, and she's going to help us today. So here are some core concepts. The Web Animation API is based on two models. It's got a timing model and an animation model. Or I like to think of them as the when, as in when things are happening, and the what, what exactly is going down. Let's take a look at the timing model. So Web Animation API is time-based. Currently, all animations have a duration, or their duration is tied to something like a scroll input. But it has to know where it starts, where it ends, and how long in between. So these durations, they create timelines. Let's use the example of the Cheshire Cat. Uh, he disappears in eight seconds, right? So we've got this timeline. We set him up from zero seconds to eight seconds, going from there to not all there. The computer knows what he looks like at any given millisecond along this timeline, right? So you could be anywhere in there and the computer would immediately know exactly how much of the Cheshire Cat to show. This is a very efficient kind of animation. So fun thing about this, because we've got these timelines, time may be shifted backwards, forward, scaled, reversed, paused, repeated. It lets us do all these kinds of things. We call this stateless animation. And it's pretty cool. And you may be familiar with request animation frame-based animations. Well, they are a bit limited. They're limited by how often the page is repainted. Uh, basically, it's um, if you have 60 animations and your frame uh, rate is 30 frames per second, it's going to take two seconds to run that animation, as opposed to if it was running at 60 frames per second. But with the Web Animations API, if you say this animation takes one second to run. It will take one second to run, even if it's only got 30 frames per second. And that's very important if you want to make sure that this thing is going to finish regardless of the frame rate. All right, let's see what else we've got in the bag. Oh, it's direction agnostic. This means it's super easy to run an animation forwards or backwards. It's a little harder to do that when you're building on a previous frame state. And it's seekable. You can plop down anywhere in that timeline and be exactly where uh, the computer already knows. And this means you are in sync no matter what. But why am I telling when I could be showing? The great thing about these is that timelines have a hierarchy and they inherit. So over on the left-hand side here, I'm making a bunch of cat elements. They all have CSS animations. And as you can see, those animations start at different times. On the right-hand side, each one of these animations is referencing that original cat's timeline and adopting its current time. So they're all running in sync. This is physically impossible with CSS animations alone. All right, this is very important for level two of the Web Animation API that introduces such things as grouping, but we won't get into that tonight. Timelines have children called animations. Animation objects line up along a timeline like trains on a track. They do this by connecting a single animation to a timeline and determines what the element, this cat, for instance, should look like at any given point. The cat state from there to not all there is called a keyframe effect. The term keyframe is interesting. It comes from traditional animation. 
keys, also known as key poses or key frames, uh, were the like pose one, pose two, right? Those are the key frames or key poses, the keys. Now, if you work for Disney, you want to be the person who draws these, right? The keys. They got translated to interaction development over to key frames. Now, if you are an intern or just a janitor or perhaps a Korean animator who work has been outsourced to, you get to draw the in-betweens between those key poses. You don't get interviewed about what it's like to be an animator. You, this is grunt work. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, computers are supposed to do that for us now. Uh, so those actually got converted over to tweens. It's interesting. Key got lengthened to keyframe, but in-betweens got shortened to tweens. So you've got a timeline, and you know what uh, the thing should look like at any given time, but how do you make it go? Well, a good metaphor for this is that the animation object plays keyframe effects sort of along a timeline, sort of the same way a DVD player plays a DVD. I'm not sure that anybody even remembers how these things work, but let's hope that we are not all children. <laughs> all right. With these two models combined, timing and animation, we're very fortunate because uh, we can use the web animation API to run every single one of these animation engines, new and dead, uh, in the browser. So here's how it's going to do that. I'm assuming everyone here has a good grasp of CSS animations and transitions. If you, if you do not, you're fortunate because I happen to have a, uh, I happen to have a course for that and you get 20% off with this key phrase here. <coughs> But I'm going to assume you understand your CSS animations and transitions. Let's take a look at exactly how we use the Web Animations API to create those. We have this because, I mean, in the browser, the Web Animation API is responsible for them. How is it doing that? Well, we got this animation player, and it takes a keyframe effect. Let's take a closer look at that keyframe effect constructor. What is a keyframe even? In the API, the keyframe effect tells the animation what it should look like at those key points, like the beginning and the end of the animation. And the animation model interpolates all the tweens, all the in-betweens, when he's halfway disappeared off that branch. This is from the original Alice in Videoland. It was done using a CSS transition. You click on the bunny, and the bunny, uh, he has a transform set on him. Well, he has a transition set that's watching his transform value. When transform changes, it changes to the new value in three seconds. So when you click on him, he gets a class of interacted, and the transform value translates to translate y 100%. That's what's moving him down. Here's that same interaction again with the web animations API. No CSS transitions. Oh, it's amazing. It works. Ah, oh, it's science, science fantastic. I love it. OK, let's see what exactly is happening here. We create this new keyframe effect, right? We pass it the DOM, the DOM element we want to be watching and animating. And this keyframe object, which is just an array of little objects full of CSS key value pairs, right? We have to give it a before and an after at this point, although we won't always have to give it a before in future iterations. We also pass it this little timing object, which includes some key value pairs of for duration, uses milliseconds, 3,000 of them, and takes things like fill for fill mode forwards. We're going to stick it in a var, and that way we can call, uh, we can pass it to an animation object. Now, by the way, this is what happens if you do not set the fill mode to forwards. When you click on that bunny, he's just going to pop right back to his original position. Fill mode forwards basically says, "I want you to maintain the last, uh, the last key pose." long after the animation has stopped playing. It's sort of like when you're playing a DVD and you get to the end, it just kind of resets <laughs> to the menu screen. Animations are like that. When they're done playing, they just kind of go, what? Fill modes are a nice way of saying, when you get to the end of the credits, just stay there. You can also use like fill mode backwards so that it starts at the very beginning. Ah, just go read up on fill modes if you don't understand. They're a lot of fun. So we know a lot of these options from their CSS counterparts. Uh, let's take a look. Take a look at some of our familiar friends. Duration, oh my gosh, it's transition animation, uh, it's transition duration or animation duration. Delay, ah, we know you. Fill, iterations, it's just a really nicer way of saying animation dash iteration dash count. They're so shorter and more concise, I love it. 
direction and uh, easing. Oh, it's the appropriate term for that. Uh, instead of animation dash timing dash function, it's easing. And instead of defaulting to the bizarre and unusual ease in, it defaults to linear, linear, which is a constant rate of change, like sane people would write us back. So important for sequencing. Um, here's some shiny keyframe timing options. Uh, end delay, these are milliseconds to delay after the end of an animation, really handy if you are staggering animations or playing them one after another. Uh, iteration start, when the iteration uh, for the animation should start. We've also got things like composite, iteration composite, uh, which are just a little too weird to get into right now. All right, so now it's time to play said animation. We're gonna do that with the animation object. Woo, make some constructors. So we got our keyframe object stored as rabbit down keyframes. And remember, if the keyframe effect contains all the info to execute an animation, the animation object is what's gonna let us play it to execute it. How does that look? Well, we're gonna take those rabbit down keyframes and we're gonna wrap them inside a new animation constructor. And this thing here is the documents timeline. Why do we have to pass the documents timeline? Because an animation constructor requires two things, a keyframe object and it requires, well, a keyframe effect and a timeline. The spec has been written in a way that allows for different kinds of timelines in the future. For instance, a scroll-based timeline or perhaps a gesture timeline. But for now, it uses the documents timeline. And so you pass it that. In this case, we're gonna store it inside a rabbit down animation uh, variable sweetness. Now, animation objects rock because they've got methods. What kind of methods? Familiar methods. Animation pause, animation can play, animation can reverse, finish, you can even cancel. Very important for when you want to have a, you just want to say, please, no, just drop it. I, I didn't mean that animation at all. Very handy. So we want to play that animation. We just do rabbit down animation, call the method of play on it. We wrap that inside a function, down he goes which we use as a, as an, as on the event listener for click. So when people click the white rabbit, down he goes, fires, and the rabbit down animation plays. And after it's over, we remove the event listener. Just gotta clean up after ourselves. So, well, that was pretty amazing. It's the web animation API. I was expecting applause, but there's no applause. That's okay. It's all right, um, that was a lot to go through for two lines of CSS, thank goodness we have a shortcut. We got this lovely thing called the animate method. It's great, you can call it on any DOM element. It's fun, fantastic, right? So if you're a CSS animations wonk, you may have noticed that the web animation API, it totally handled this transition like an animation uh, with a big pile of keyframes. Oh my gosh, I, I have, am I at 7.30 or 7.40? We can do this, all right. Anyway, all you have to know is uh, there, that, that is kind of interesting, but we're gonna look at the, the CSS animations and how they're done with the Web Animation API right now. You can't see it quite well, but she's changing colors as she's spinning. We're, gonna re, we're going to reproduce this set of CSS using the Web Animations API's shortcut, the animate method. So, Basically how it works is you get your DOM element, you call animate on it, you pass the keyframes, you pass it some timing options, and boom, you get an animation. Here's how we converted that CSS over into a keyframe object. That looks really good, doesn't it? I mean, you can almost read it. It looks like CSS, feels like CSS, must be CSS. Wonderful. Uh, especially notice here that we have this thing called offset. Offset's important, we'll get to that. The time, this is the timing object. Once again, we've got the duration of 3,000 milliseconds, iterations, infinity. Nice use of the capital I, infinity there. We're gonna put them together. So element becomes document get element by E. We're gonna go get Alice. We call animate on her. We pass the keyframes, Alice tumbling. We pass the timing, Alice timing, and boom. So the offset is actually making up for the color change at the 30% line. Offsets are a way you can tell the different animation to only run at a certain time. Otherwise, that color change would have run around 50% of the way through. Uh, offsets are pretty cool. I'd go into them more, but I don't have the time. 
let's talk about what you're really here for, callbacks. Okay, now you're here for the promises, but I like callbacks. So I didn't come here to show you the long way to do CSS animations. Let's look at the cooler things that we can do. That animation object gives us some nice attributes. It lets us do decidedly more than CSS does. You get this on finish promise, this on cancel promise. Oh my gosh, there's a ready promise. So many promises and it keeps them all. Pending, which is read only, it's Boolean. It's, uh, it basically informs you that the animation is waiting to run. Uh, play state, which is read only, use methods to change it. That's a way if you, you can check it to tell if it's like paused or it's running. Uh, the playback rate, we'll get to you later. And effect, which is kind of like the animations version of this. It points to the keyframe effect. Uh, the, yes. So the animations keyframe effect and its timing and animation props. One day we might have other kinds of effects, groups, sequences, uh, more on those later. For now, we just have a keyframe effect. All right, more fun animation attributes. Uh, there are a couple of others. We've got current time, which gives you the location where you are on your current timeline, and finished, which is a callback, and I like it. We're gonna play with these two. There's a famous scene where Alice is drinking and eating and she's growing bigger and smaller, and I thought that would make a really fun little game. It would be very hard to do this with CSS animation alone, uh, but I thought surely this is a job for the web animations API. And this is how I had, this is kind of what I had in mind here. You click and hold the eat me cupcake and she gets bigger, or if you go over and click and hold drink me, she gets smaller. Oh, it's so cute, she's such a cute little girl. I did some fun stuff with the SVGs over there. We can talk more about that in another talk, but anyway. The way you think about this is that Alice is on a timeline. She's going from big to small. And when the game starts, we've got, hey, go back there, big to small. And when the game starts, she's right here in the middle. And we're using the cupcake and the drink to move her forwards and backwards. We're scrubbing forwards and backwards along that timeline. So first, we use the animate method. We go out, we get Alice, and we have you know, the tiny part where she's scaled down to half her size and the big part where she's up to twice her size and the timing options. And then we have to hit pause. Fun thing about the, uh, the animate method is that it runs it immediately. So if you want it to not run immediately, you always end up using pause. You can see it all over in people's animation patterns. Uh, this, the organization is considering whether or not it should run automatically, given how often that happens. All right, so let's play it through. Sweet. That's what happens when you don't do animation uh, pause. So we're gonna pause her. And an Alice change, pause, great. Oh, now she's little. She's at her, her beginning state where she's super tiny. And this is what it's like when she's at her finish state. We use a finish to set her back to the, the finish state. We want her to be halfway between those two states. So we're going to set her current time, Alice change dot current time is going to be equal to, oh my gosh, it's a really long way of getting this Alice change Oh, it's gonna be effect, yes, it's effect. Effect timing uh, and duration. And that sets uh, her current time to the end. We're gonna divide it by half and boom. Now we have set her current time to be halfway of her duration. And we're referencing her duration so we don't have to make it a variable that we maintain. So clever, but so long in a selector. These slides are all available online too. Don't worry, I'll give them to you afterward. And then we set these controls. So we've got the timeline. Uh, we've set the playhead. Now we need to control the playhead on that timeline. We're gonna use the cake in the bottle to send it forward and backward. We know forwards already, so let's go backwards. How we do that? We change the playback rate to negative one. So Alice change, playback rate, negative one. And we hit play. And we tie that to whenever somebody goes mouse down on the, uh, the drinking event. Let's take a look at how that looks. And we go over, we hold down, and all of a sudden, the animation is playing all the way backwards. There's some other fun stuff that we do uh, to make this fully work, to hit pause when the, when the mouse up has happened. We basically uh, make this stop playing Alice function. 
and we add a listener to all kinds of things. But we're running out of time. It has two endings. In the story, Alice wants to get through a tiny door. So she eats the cake, but she gets huge. She can reach the key to the door, but she can't get through it. She throws a tantrum. She cries her eyes out. I know exactly how she feels. Um, she, when she drinks from the small bottle, she gets so tiny, she ends up swimming around in a pool of her own tears with this mouse, makes some really racist comments to the mouse who promptly cold shoulders her and swims away to safety while Alice continues to flounder about. That sounds like a great Saturday night. So I made little vignettes for both of these scenes, her being too small and forgetting the key, and her being too large and crying herself uh, to sleep. Well, good thing. We have two more timelines in both of these little anima uh, animations, the eating and drinking animations. And what happens is that when we get to the end of one of the animations, uh, when either runs out, what we do is we animate. <laughs> when either one of these animation ends, what we do, and I'm not gonna show you the code for this, is we animate where her current time is on that, play on that, on that timeline. And we find out if she is overall at the beginning of her timeline, indicating she's smaller. And we play the small looking up at the key vignette. Or if she's toward the end, we play the one where she's too big. It's cute. It's fun. It's a great way. You can check out the slides and more of the code pens on the interwebs. In the meantime, I am going to skip ahead to give you some fun information on uh, things, other things we can do. For instance, there's another demo where you can actually change the playback rate to make them, uh, make them go faster when you click on them by multiplying that playback rate uh, by like 1.1 over and over again. And there's a decay on the playback rates of the things all around them. So the more that you click on them, the faster they go. And it also changes the rate of the things around them. Uh, it's great. It's from the, the Through the Looking Glass game. I love it. You should check that one out too. Away. Go to the po code pens, explore. So Rachel, when can we use this API? The good news is you can start using it today. Uh, in fact, I recommend that you do so. It has, uh, there's a polyfill, which all these demos use. I don't really recommend using the polyfill, but if you are catering to people on Internet Explorer, you might. Uh, features are rolling out in Firefox and Chrome all the time. I believe Firefox is completely feature complete on this. Uh, Edge. Uh, from the people who suggested the API in the first place, has moved it into their hopper for full support and coverage. In fact, I actually recommend that you use Edge's API catalog to look up the support because can I use doesn't really get into the granularity of which methods are supported, et cetera. So visit status.microsoft.edge, uh, microsoftedge.com to see the, uh, the details of each property and support. If you want to see it in Edge, go to user voice and vote for it. As for WebKit, WebKit's actually pretty darn awesome. Uh, they have been doing some great work with this API. It has started showing up in their dev preview on iOS and desktop. So we know that it's coming to iPhones everywhere very soon. Very excited about that. The Web Animations API is showing up in the wild. For instance, Stripe is using it in their payment processing animations. There's a really cool write-up on that online. And it's also showing up in a few animation libraries like this one, Just Animate made by a great community member of the web animation community. Hopefully, big animation libraries could build on top of this API for improved performance and accessibility. And it would give tools like Spirit.js, et cetera, a nice export format for us to interface with. And of course, more implementation means we're gonna have better tools across all browsers, including ones like Chrome Canary. Level two of the spec introduces grouping and sequencing, which changes everything, gives us a very flash-like interface to work with. Dan Wilson wrote a great post about it. I recommend you go there to read more about it. So all animation is is time, all the web animations API is is time and change. And that, well, it changes everything. It makes way for the future animation specs we haven't even met yet, and the future of animation online. I would like to thank a couple of great people, Alex Miller for helping me with some of my in-betweening, Opal Essence for doing the logos, Chris Mills at Mozilla for, for helping me with all the documentation, and Brian Vertles, the author of the spec, for answering all of my questions. I hope you had a good time tonight. Allison, I thank you. If you want to learn more about the Web Animations API, visit rachelneighbors.com slash W-A-A-P-I. 
You can sign up for webanimationweekly.com, uh, the newsletter, to get all the latest news on this API in your inbox every week. And you can join the Slack Animation Network community where you can get your, answer, your questions answered by the API's authors and more. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Can you hear me? Perfect. So my name is Andre, and I would like to talk about prototyping with code. It's not a super technical talk. It's more of you know, what I've learned talk. And this is the plan for the talk. You'll be answering these three questions. Why to experiment? Why prototype? Why is it important? How do we actually implement it? Um, specifically some of the code tricks. And uh, the most sneaky question, so what? So, so what do we prototype? What do we get from it? What are some of the outcomes? And I'll start with a story. In 2012, I've joined this startup called Hamus, And I joined actually as a Java developer. I used to be a Java developer back in the days. And uh, I joined because it was like a very challenging job. We were writing our own advertisement network, so we had to handle huge amounts of traffic, and it was very challenging and interesting. And the thing is that six months later, after we've solved all those you know, hard problems on the back end and we've uh, built super cool and fancy architectures, the company flopped, it just, it just closed. You know, We've done all the hard work and then Nothing. I, um, you know, I didn't stop there. I went to work further in uh, startups, in outsourcing companies, in large enterprises, as an engineer, as a team lead, and eventually as a product manager. Um, but mostly focusing on startups. And right now I'm on sabbatical, and I'm doing these two projects. One is called Code Podcast. It's about generic concepts in programming, and uh, this new project of mine is called Polychops, and it is about helping musicians practice and you know, getting more out of their practice. But getting back to Hamus, like what happened? Why, like we worked so well and the team was great. You know, some of those people are now senior engineers in Microsoft, some of them are CTOs in, you know, in larger companies. What happened? Well, once I looked into what we are doing in outsourcing companies and in enterprise companies, I realized that we are basically doing the same things in startup, especially now with the agile culture being everywhere. You know, we have something like a 
product person, maybe it's a CEO in a startup or a product manager, which comes up with a spec and then the spec goes into development or first to design, then to development, then to QA and eventually the code gets into production. So this process is the same, but results vary. You know, enterprises, large enterprises don't close every six months. Outsourcing companies don't do that either. So what's different? And the most important thing that I've noticed is that the context is different. Now, think about it. If you are working on a product, um, who of you thinks that the product you, that you are working on has just too many features? Yeah. All right, there are some hands. All right, and who thinks that you know there is just maybe one or two feature that we definitely need to implement you know, to advance the product and you know, to make it the product better? No, a few hands. The thing is that for me, oftentimes, when I would ask these two questions to the team, those hands that come up, they would be from the same people. So I was like, huh, the same people say that their product has too many features and also they want more features to build. Like, what happened? Where is this coming from? Why is it happening? And the, the conclusion that I came up with is that outsourcing companies, what they have is the, they have the context of certainty. You know, there is a customer that comes to you as an outsourcer and says, this is the spec implemented in the best possible way. Go and do this. And in a startup, we don't have this luxury. Usually, you know, there, there are just vague signals from the market and, you know, we probably know what we want to build and which problem we want to solve, but not really. But still, we use the same process. We kind of, there is a product manager that comes up with a spec, build, brings it to design, and now, you know, or developers, and now build it. And imagine what it is like to be this person. I mean, they have to pretend that, you know, they understand the world perfectly and they can foresee the future and know the customer, you know, and uh, yeah, they, they basically most of the time have to pretend because there is a lot of uncertainty on the market. And uh, what we end up with is we end up doing safer bets than we probably could have. Uh, and, uh, you know, 90% of startups most of the time fail. So I was thinking about this. Is there a better way? Is there something that we can do differently? Turns out there is a way. And, um, Thinking about uncertainty in a broader context, I think in the startup we have uncertainty coming from three big places. It's the market, you know, what is our demographics, how big is the market, how, how much are they willing to pay. Uh, the product, you know, what is the problem that, cust that our customers have, what is the solution that we can offer them. And the implementation, like can we even build this product? For instance, you know, we know that a pill that will cure cancer probably will find the market. You know, that's not, that's not something we need to test, but can we actually create this peel? Is it possible from an implementation standpoint is a question that we need to ask. And so uh, instead of this execution mindset that we are using when building features from specs, I think we need to change our focus and first solve the uncertainty part. So the goal of the research mode, I believe should be reducing uncertainty rather than implementing an ideal working feature. So think about it in this way. You know, 90% of startups fail. What if we launch 100 or like, what if, we, what if we launch 10 products and one of them succeeds? That's all we need. That's basically the mindset behind prototyping. Here's an example from my personal project, uh, Polychops, which is, you know, it started off as a metronome but with a weird interface, a circle interface, and it was, you know, unusual. And I didn't know whether it would help people practice better, musicians, whether it would be inspiring, whether, how would it work even? Will it work with, you know, uh, in a web browser or should I build native apps? I had all those questions. And there could be a possibility of me just going forward and, you know, creating a spec end to end and building it. But instead I chose a different way. I chose a way of, you know, doing research. And 
research, when we are talking about research, uh, the market research is usually done just on, in an Excel spreadsheet and using Google search. Uh, product and implementation research is something else. Uh, here we oftentimes need to expose something to, to people you know, to understand whether they get it, whether we get it, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that the best tool that we as humanity have so far for reducing uncertainty is scientific method. You know, there is, you know, it's not ideal. We have, we as humans have biases and so on and so forth. But this is the best thing we have. So what is a scientific method? We basically come up with a hypothesis, we come up with an experiment, and then we run this experiment and we see whether it failed or succeeded. And prototypes is a way to run those experiments. Basically, prototypes are carefully constructed illusions that help us verify whether the hypothesis is true or false. Nothing else, it's not a product that we will sell immediately, you know, it's not an ideal implementation, it's just an illusion, like a movie set or a theater stage. And I believe that in order to build successfully prototypes, we have to kind of put our best selves, our technical best selves on the shelf for a while and, you know, uh, take a step back. Because we as engineers, as designers, as product managers just want to you know, do the best stuff. Designers want to build pixel-perfect mockups. Developers want to build architectures and so on and so forth. But for, for prototypes, we kind of need to become rookies again. We, we want to become beginners. Because experts often uh, make mistakes in uncertainty, in the context of uncertainty. And there is research that confirms that. Because experts, you know, they know what they need to do, whereas Rookies usually don't know what they need to do, and so they seek constant feedback. And this is a very valuable trait. Experts design architectures. Rookies, they are happy with something that works, and this is what we are looking for. Experts approximate in the future. Rookies just live in the moment. Experts have reputations at stake, and so you know they're very invested in whatever solution they are offering and they tend to double down on the solution even if it doesn't work, whereas rookies are not invested, they basically don't care. So to sum up and explain it to a teenage self, instead of being this guy or girl, you want to be kind of this person. Like, I don't know. Um, how do we do that? What are some of the concrete tools and practices that we can use in order to, to achieve that. Well, I believe the, the most important part uh, is even before we start prototyping, even before we write the first line of code or build the first video to, to test something, we need to think about where we will find feedback on that thing that we are testing. Whether we will go online and search for feedback online maybe, whether we will uh, invite someone to the office. We need to have this in mind. We, we need to have the end in mind before we start doing anything. And the shorter the feedback cycle, the better. You know, theoretically, in this company I was working at, Hamus, we did have the feedback cycle. You know, it was just, you know, six months or whatever, four months long. And at the end of the feedback cycle, we just found out that we don't have any more money in the bank, you know. That's also a feedback cycle, it's just very long. So what we need to do is we need to shorten the feedback cycle. Here's an example from another startup I was working at. It's a B2B startup that sells the product to kind of large enterprises. What we've built is a piece of software that uh, allows you to drag and drop create mobile applications. And those mobile applications, they extract data in the background from an actual web application. So if you have an old CRM system or an old Salesforce system that doesn't work on your phone, you can build a nice mobile app in a matter of you know, a couple of hours. And you know, it's a nice product, but the thing is that in large enterprises, the sales cycle is at least six months. That means that we get to build whatever our fantasy allows us during those six months, you know, to just then later realize that it was all just you know, a dream. <laughs> we don't need this. And so what, what did we do? We created an internal team that would serve the customer, but would also build just you know random applications that we would find random use cases. 
and they would just do that. And that allowed us to have super short feedback cycle because there was a dedicated team that was using the product and feeding us uh, super early feedback. That was great. Uh, another example from Polychops, um, we started with super early on with publishing videos on Reddit and so on and so forth, asking people for feedback and maybe asking for engagement. So some of the people uh, agreed to have a call with us, for instance, and you know have a conversation about how they practice, what are the types of metronomes they use, and so on and so forth. And those conversations, they actually yielded great results. And that leads me to the next point seek qualitative feedback. Because quantitative feedback oftentimes leads to local optimizations. What do I mean by that? Uh, quantitative feedback only gives you an answer yes or no. Is the green button better than the red button? You know, these kind of uh, questions we can answer with the data. But qualitative, da uh, qualitative data can kind of, the person can tell you, hey, I don't need a button here. You know, this is something that you can automate completely. And this open, opens your mind to completely different perspectives. One example of a company that is heavily reliant on quantitative data and on A-B testing is booking.com. I don't know, I think there is space for improvement on the website. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. Now, um, here is a story from, from, from one of the people that we did an interview with. Uh, so remember, we started uh, Polychops uh, as a metronome application, you know, just a metronome. And we interviewed one person and they said, hey, can I export the sound of the metronome and have it like as an audio file? We were like, why, why would you do that? This is so backwards. Like, why would you do that in, with a metronome? And he was like, no, 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 I, I just want to put it in a digital audio workstation and then record myself on top of the metronome and then listen back and hear if I'm on time or not. And we were like, wow, this is actually genius. Like, hey, can we, can we ask 15 more people if they do the same? And turns out, yes, people just turn on the metronome, put the uh, whatever recorder app on their phone, record themselves playing and then listen back to understand whether they are on time or not. And so we were like, hey, we can just build this in the app. Like, you don't need to have a separate recorder, a separate metronome. We can show you the beats. We can show you, you know, the waveform, everything, all in one place. So this, is su this, this was super insightful. And we would never get this information with just A-B testing. Like, we, would, we wouldn't have even this idea. Now, another important principle is the interface in a prototype is everything. And I do mean interface in a very broad sense. So for instance, in Polychops, the interface is the graphical user interface, but it is also the sound, because the user also perceives the sound in the app. In an API, the interface is your documentation that describes all the methods in an API. Speaking about APIs, in Productive Mobile, at some point we, we decided to rewrite some of the APIs that we exposed to app creators. And so instead of going the usual way of me as a product manager just specking the whole thing very thoroughly and then giving it to developers to implement, uh, we went a different route. We created a small file with a documentation where all the methods were written and all the signatures were described. And then we took that API and we kind of built, we fake built those apps with the persons, uh, with the people that were using the application to build actual mobile apps to build mobile apps on paper, so to say, you know, and all the data that would be uh, uh, processed in the API, we did all the processing also on paper by ourselves. And so we did maybe five or six iterations before we understood, okay, this is the ideal API. We can actually serve, you know, 90% of the use cases that we want to cover. Let's spec it and build it. So we kind of saved a lot of time using that. Wow, I didn't know the sound would work. But this is the very first uh, prototype of Polychops and is just a video. And initially I coded it in Flash. <laughs> and it was like, hey, friends, look at it. It's perfect, it's your future metronome. And people said, yeah, we, we can understand polyrhythms. You know, we can understand two over three. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's the purpose. And this is how Polychops looks now. And you know, it's not much different. Even though on this thing, I spent maybe 
10 minutes, and on this thing I spent maybe a month. All right, um, and talking about faking, um, you know, we are all taught, especially as developers, to build nice architectures, to, we are taught the uh, Gang of Four design patterns and so on and so forth. But the thing is that when you're building prototypes, you kind of accumulate um, a set of patterns that is the opposite of whatever we were taught to do. And this is super interesting. So for instance, uh, in Polyshops, we wanted at some point to test multiple users interacting with each other. And instead of building the proper authentication, which is you know very risky, very expensive, takes a lot of time, you need to test it, you need to pen test it, we just you know we said okay it's a prototype, we will just save a token or a user ID in local storage, and we will send it with every request, and bam, we have users that are authenticated. You know we will send them the, the official um, memo saying hey don't don't use it, don't put any sensitive data there. But it was enough to test the concept. And kind of over time, you accumulate those kind of patterns. And it's important to think about it as a, as a library. Now, several minor tips. Um, use a design system, you know, because you don't, yay, uh, be because you don't want to spend your mental energy and time uh, thinking through every possible interaction in your app. Certainly we did this mistake because initially we built the app from scratch and we came up with all the buttons and you know we built super custom interface. But then we found out that we need to build notifications and menus and you know uh, parent-child views and drop downs. And what do you do? Do you design it all from scratch? No, it's just easier if you use something ready made. Material is a good example at least of you know way of documenting stuff where everything is very clear. Uh, you can take it and use it. Still. No, seriously, uh, don't steal from your competitors though, because whatever they've built, they probably have already tested and it probably works. You don't need to prototype it, you know, it works, just copy. <laughs> <laughs> but steal from other industries, from, you know, parallel uh, industries. So for example, this feature with recording and playing back was heavily inspired by digital audio workstations like Logic and Ableton and so on and so forth, but it's massively simplified. So, you know, don't just, copy it one-to-one, uh, -one, but you steal a lot of ideas. Um, you will go into depth, especially as engineers, and it's okay. So one example of it is we are all taught this don't repeat yourself principle, you know, God forbid you copy, copy paste the code two times, Whoa, no. Um, in while prototyping, I've noticed that I, I have a rule that I copy the code at least three times before I abstract it out and create an abstraction on top of it. At least three times. Why? Because over time you see that you know the code diverges. Something that you saw that is similar is actually different. And you know, after you've copied the code maybe three to five times and you see that it's completely the same, then you can abstract it out and create something on top of it. But the good thing with copying as well, even if they do diverge, but maybe just a little, your shape of abstraction is super clear. Because you know, okay, I just need these two parameters that are custom and everything else is the same. I know how to build my abstraction. Because we don't refactor and because we don't have specs, just don't write tests, don't bother, seriously. You will throw them away. <laughs> now, if this slide would be taken out of context <laughs> and go on Twitter tonight, I know all your faces. Right. Abstract out libraries and frameworks. This is the only thing that you probably do want to abstract out. Because for instance, something we did in Polychops is we started using Redux because we had a lot of uh, logic on the front end with all those metronomes and stuff. But then we understood that it would be safer, to, uh, safer and faster to sync some of the data with Apollo and GraphQL. So we had two competing frameworks in the same prototype, which is a huge no-no. But we could do that because our dumb components didn't know about the wrappers. They didn't know about where the data comes from because all of this stuff was abstracted. Another example, we, we kind of got used to uh, making folder structures that are following a framework, um, such as you know we have action creators and reducers and middleware files or folders. 
Uh, well, this is something you also want to avoid. I mean, generally in development, but especially in prototypes, because what you want to do at some point is maybe to switch the library or you know take it away completely. So it's a good idea to maybe think in terms of your domain model rather than the framework structure. So for instance, in Rails, it's very you know it's very strict. You have to use the the controllers and stuff like that. I mean, consider maybe not doing that if you will switch at some point. Right, but do not go bankrupt, you know, especially under pressure, it's very easy to do. You show a prototype to, to your boss and they're like, oh, okay, great, it works, let's, let's push it into production. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> um, be clear with your superior uh, officers or whatever that this code is a prototype and it's not an actual thing. It will help you to validate your hypothesis and to experiment and to understand the direction, but it's not production code. So. Whenever you decide that experiment succeeded and you want to keep the prototype, just come back and rewrite it. And now, but then, you know, we are borrowing the time from the future. Why do we even bother writing, uh, you know, bad practice code if we will rewrite it? Well, the thing is that a lot of experiments or some of the experiments will fail. And so some of the code you will just throw away. Or maybe some of the experiments will show you some inconclusive results but they will definitely point you in the right direction and you will have to maybe rebuild something differently compared to how you did it in the prototype. So we still get some value there. To sum up all, the, uh, all, the, all that was said so far, we have two contexts in the company. We have the context of certainty and the context of uncertainty. Certainty is when your customer uh, in an outsource company comes to you and says, this is the spec, implement. They have already resolved all the uncertainty. You know, you don't have to resolve it. Uh, uncertainty context is when you know your product manager tries to guess which feature is would would best serve your customers. And in those two contexts, we have two different mechanisms that we can use. In a certainty context, we just go for implementation. You know, best code possible, best mockups possible. In an uncertainty context, we go in the opposite direction. We want to do research. We want to do exploration. And so. We want to also embrace different mindsets. You know, we don't want to be hardcore designers or developers or product managers when we are in an uncertainty context. We just want to explore, we want to be open-minded. So what, like what are the results? You know, show me the money. Uh, so <laughs> I, think, I think before I talk about results, I think it's important to mention that what I'm talking about right now is decision quality. I'm not talking about outcomes so far. An example is, you know, because we are dealing with uncertainty, we can just guess one, one time, write a spec, and be right, and get huge output from that. But maybe the probability of this was initially just 10% and we got lucky. Or we can do all the best possible research, and we can just, with the probability of 90% of, of success, we got into the rest of the 10% and we failed. You know, so I think it's important to think about decision quality versus the outcome quality as well. But talking about outcomes real quick, which is not as important. For instance, in Productive Mobile, after we speed up the, the feedback cycle and we've implemented all the changes, we've started, the platform started covering maybe 90% of use cases instead of initial 20. And those 90% of use cases we started covering in a matter of days rather than weeks. So, you know, it's a huge improvement. And what's the most important thing about that uh, is that we didn't implement maybe, you know, on average five specs every half a year. So those specs, we just, you know, we experimented, we explored them, and we understood that we rather don't understand them, or we don't understand the customer, or, you know, something is off. And that that is actually a huge win. We didn't do some work, you know, it's great. All right, um, I think I don't have much time, but if you are willing to talk to, you, to your stakeholders and if you want to understand how to sell all, all that approach, there is some information in the material in the article that I uh, put after the talk. And I hope you will get to apply some of those learnings and I hope you will build great products and at some point I too will be one of your happy customers.
Uh, I'm so excited to tell you about the story of GitLab front-end evolution. Uh, my name is Fatih. I am a, a senior front-end engineer at GitLab. I'm also a Google Web, uh, Google developer expert in web technologies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, GitLab, and also, uh, of course, GitHub uh, with the uh, username at Fatih Ajit. Uh, so let's talk about what is GitLab. Um, GitLab is an open source software development tool which provides a single application for every step of your DevOps lifecycle. I will tell you what this means. So it's, uh, uh, and GitLab's goal is to make software development faster so you can spend more time writing on your code and doing your uh, actual stuff like instead of, instead of uh, working with the configuration and like uh, maintaining stuff. Um, so this means like what I'm, mean with the single application for complete DevOps lifecycle is this. Uh, where is it? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we have this manage, plan, create, verify, secure, package, release, configure, and monitor steps. Uh, this is the steps of a DevOps lifecycle, and we try to provide a single application for every step of this, uh, this, this uh, DevOps lifecycle. For example, for the manage, uh, manage step, we have cycle analytics, and we have uh, we have DevOps score. For plan, we have issue tracker, issue boards, and for example, package, we have uh, image building, uh, content, uh, container registry. For example, this release, we have CD, and we have also a CI, and automation like re uh, review apps. For the monitoring, we have metrics, infrastructure monitoring, and stuff like that. So we have, uh, we provide all of these uh, in, within GitLab. So this is the repository view uh, of GitLab, uh, where you see the files in here, where you can see the like, uh, over repository. And this is the issue boards, which is pretty much the, uh, something like Trello, where you can uh, drag and drop the issues on the boards, on different boards. Um, this is merge request view, where you can uh, see the merge request changes, and then you can merge it or uh, close it, or, uh, and then you can see the pipelines in here. Uh, which is a CI/CD configurations. Um, this is the pipelines. Uh, so you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five running pipelines, and this is passed, this is skipped, and yeah, this is also skipped. Uh, so let's talk about the GitLab company. Uh, GitLab is a remote-only company uh, with more than uh, 300 employees uh, from 41 country. Uh, and on the front-end side, we have uh, 19 uh, front-end engineers, and we are growing. Uh, I was the, I believe, fourth or fifth front-end employee when I joined at GitLab on 2016 May. Uh, and I was, I was the 75th employee of GitLab, and now we have uh, 320. Uh, we are growing really fast. Uh, I also want to mention on something about uh, this team handbook, which GitLab offers. Uh, it is an open source guide, which is a really definitive guide that how we run our company. Uh, basically, you can see that it is, a, for example, general rules, people operations, engineering functions, uh, like the marketing, uh, sales, finance, and product, and, and legal stuff. So you can basically find everything related with GitLab uh, in these documentations. For example, the, how we do our front end, uh, or, or how we do backend management, how we do our software management, uh, also how we run our company, how we do our marketing efforts and stuff like that. Uh, also, we are hiring. Uh, we have these. Uh, we are we have different engineering positions open. Uh, I was thinking to I added the number of here, but I don't. I don't see it right now. So we have like uh, six, uh, six, ten. I think we have like 20 different uh, engineering positions open right now. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about the GitLab front end. Uh, I joined GitLab at uh, May 2016, and at that time we had uh, not at that time. We, GitLab is actually a Ruby on Rails application, uh, and at that time we had uh, the Rails asset pipeline, which is something like um, a, something that allows you to uh, build your CSS and JavaScript in a Rails magic way, which works really great. 
for the uh, small Rails application, but when you go in that scale, when you, when you scale your application, so you, you feel like, okay, this is something that, I need something more front-end tools. And then, uh, at that time, we, have, uh, we had a uh, jQuery-based code base. We still have, uh, but we do better. Uh, so I will tell you, the, uh, I, I will share the more updates on this. Um, and we had Hamel templates, um, which is the, Hamel is the language for uh, a backend uh, templating language, which works with the Ruby on Rails. And uh, we also had some inline JavaScript in Hamel templates. So it was basically like uh, a old school classical application uh, where you can uh, render HTML on server and deliver to front end. And uh, to do so, we had to like, uh, for the template engine, we using the Hamel, we were using Hamel. And then uh, like we, for some reason, for instantiating new classes or new, uh, new stuff on JavaScript side, we needed to add some Hamel code uh, sorry, JavaScript code into Hamel part. And then we had, uh, we were using CoffeeScript as our primary language, and then we were compiling the JavaScript, of course. But the thing is, uh, I really love CoffeeScript, I still love, uh, but the, it feels like ES6 uh, is really uh, a replacement, can be a replacement of CoffeeScript, and that's, that's why we replaced with it with. And the reason is, uh, it, GitLab is an open source project, so everyone can contribute, actually, but uh, it was really hard for, for contributors to contribute with CoffeeScript code. And then we see uh, a lot more contributions when we switch to JavaScript, or oh, yes. And then uh, we replaced with, on June 2016, we replaced CoffeeScript with ES6. And uh, this was a merge request I created uh, two years ago on a Saturday night with my lead. And it was basically, we write some uh, bash scripts to, uh, to some, Bash scripts to basically uh, get the all uh, CoffeeScript files and convert it, convert them to JavaScript files and write them into the uh, with the relevant name to relevant directories. And then I basically pushed everything to uh, with these merge requests. And it was like me uh, when they do git blame, I was like party party in every lines, and like the code was basically a. a um, a transpiled code from CoffeeScript to, uh, to JavaScript. It was actually in a bad state, but uh, the reason is why we did this is we will make sure that it will work because in the end, the CoffeeScript will be compiled to JavaScript and that's the code in production we use. So basically we will make sure that, uh, okay, this will work in production and it worked. On July, 2016, we added ESTing to our code base uh, our uh, Vini did this uh, for us. And then uh, on November 2016, we replaced uh, Rails Asset Pipeline with Webpack. And then we also replaced, with the same merge request, we replaced uh, T-Spoon Rails Jam with Karma Test Runner. On 2017 of February, we switched to Yarn. And like as you can see that we are uh, going forward like as a much more uh, front-end uh, technologies, we are adding much more front-end technologies to our stack. And let's, I will take you a little bit back on time. Uh, on 2016, we added Vue.js. Uh, well, I, like, when I click this, uh, you will see some animations, but <laughs> actually, it's not a, sorry, <laughs> I wouldn't expect this. So this, I, 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 I was actually thinking that this would be something cool, but no, uh, not today. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, to, on 2000, November 2016, we upgraded to View 2, View, view version 2. Uh, like, let's, yeah, August 2016, and then like a few, uh, see that animation again, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then like a few months later, when we uh, add View to our stack, View version 2 released, and then like uh, we needed to some, um, some, it was, it was, it was a basically a, like a, um, major version change, so we needed to do some adjustments to make sure that we, uh, we upgraded to Vue 2, Vue version 2. Uh, okay, so the question is, why did we choose Vue? Uh, as you can see from the timeline, uh, we didn't have Webpack and NPM in our front-end stack. So basically, we wanted to, uh, we considered that React or Angular, but they were required much more to, uh, tooling at that time, and uh, Vue was, 
we is a progressive framework, which means that you can add uh, view.min.js to your uh, application, and then you can basically use it. So we basically don't need to, we basically didn't need to change anything. We just add, uh, it's like jQuery.js. We added view.js into our code base and we started creating view components on it. And then like, uh, and then we started using single file components of view with, with Webpack when we had Webpack. So it is, it is a progressive enhancement on your code base. And uh, we are actually in a huge competition with uh, GitHub. And so basically, uh, we don't have any time to rewrite things. Like we cannot sit down and, and, and start everything from scratch. Uh, we cannot do that. We have to make sure that we will ship uh, to production in every 20 seconds of, uh, of that month, no matter what. GitLab basically releases a new version on every 20 seconds of the month. So we cannot uh, rewrite everything. There's really no, t no time for that. Um, also, Vue was uh, something much smaller, and it was actually much faster from the uh, others, from the competitors. And it is actually uh, a small framework, which is really easy to learn, and it allowed uh, contributors to contribute because it's a really uh, growing framework, so it was easy to uh, find the contributors from outside, and also it was easy for us to learn so we continue uh, uh, continue shipping on production uh, with, without uh, dealing with this uh, highest learning curve. And also, uh, Vue has a really great e ecosystem and also the community. And it is actually, uh, I believe, it is the most start project on GitHub right now. Uh, so yeah, oh, again, the, the, the start count doesn't mean anything on quality, but actually, it shows that. It, it, that's a trending, trending project, and that it has a uh, attention from the uh, JavaScript community. So that's uh, something nice. Uh, so what is the outcome? Uh, when we add view to our stack, we see that we started to write less code. Uh, it was before um, the Haml templates are rendered on server, and then they get to uh, the to page with in the uh, in they. Uh, deliver to uh, front end with, from the server, and then like we do uh, jQuery uh, stuff, like select this and bind click that, and then uh, when you change page, make sure that uh, we remove the older listeners, and it was like, yeah, something really uh, crazy jQuery stuff. But with Vue, we started to write less code, and uh, less code means, of course, less bugs, hopefully. Uh, and the bugs were easy to fix because uh, because you really don't need to, to write custom stuff. For example, when you uh, click a button, if you want to change the text, you don't need to select that element or uh, change the inner text or inner HTML of it. Uh, Vue does that. When you change the data, Vue will change the, uh, that element text uh, for you. So it was basically, uh, it was easy for us to fix the bugs. Um, and then we started to have reusable components uh, it is something really nice that where you can create reusable components and re and then you can use it on the other page of your other part of your application. Uh, yeah, th this is actually something nice. Vue allowed us to start working on real time updates faster. Uh, imagine that uh, there's a merge request widget where you can merge merge a merge merge a merge request. Uh, let's open up two different tabs, when you merge a merge request on that tab, and you should accept that it's, it is updated on the other page, right? Uh, with jQuery, uh, we can do, let's assume that we are doing polling to a server or, or, or a socket uh, connection. In, uh, with, with jQuery, you need to do, uh, like you need to update a lot of stuff, like update this text, update that, update this, and stuff like that. But with, we, uh, with jQuery, you just uh, need to Sorry, with Vue, you just need to uh, get the latest data and set it to your store, and Vue will make sure that, uh, Vue will update your uh, component again, and you will make sure that it actually works. And it actually like has the latest information on the page you want to show. Or for example, when you, uh, when we, when someone writes a new comment to your, uh, to your merge request or issue, 
all, you, all we need to do is basically get the data and push, into, push it into the discussions array, and we will just render it. So we basically don't need to do anything. And this is a really huge uh, moment for us to go on real-time update path. How do we use Vue? Uh, we use Vuex for state management. I will tell you more about this later. Uh, we have standalone smart components. It is basically like single page applications, but for the components, smart, comp smart components. I will also tell you more about this. Um, we, build, we build new things with Vue. Uh, we still have jQuery part. We still have Haml part because we cannot refactor everything. We cannot, uh, we cannot basically rewrite everything from scratch. So we still have legacy code, but we are, uh, we are replacing with the parts with uh, Vue, and we build everything, every new stuff with Vue. Yeah, and uh, we rewrite all parts when we really need to. Uh, this means if we will create something else on top of that existing feature, uh, we consider that uh, so it is time to rewrite it with Vue because we are planning to add something more onto this uh, component, on th onto this page. And that's, that is the uh, decision point of a rewrite if we want to. So how do we use Vue again? Uh, this is the merge request page. Uh, so this is actually a component itself. Uh, as you can see, the, 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 the uh, yellow area, yeah? Uh, the, on the Haml side, we just have an element called, for example, div ID merge request widget. And then uh, when the page is loaded, we instantiate a new view component, uh, which takes the data from server, as a JSON and then renders this component. And then we do some uh, polling to server to get the latest data and then we update the store and we, for, uh, we will do, for example, this app root by or merge by uh, title. So we will do the uh, real-time updates for us. Uh, this is a component and this is also another component, the discussions, uh, there is another component, uh, the assignee, and then we have this and this and other components. So on the page, multiple uh, smart components on the page. Uh, this is the merge request changes tab where you can see the change divs. And uh, this whole thing as a component, and then this is actually another component which, where you, uh, which you see the, from the previous page. It is basically the not component. We reuse that on, the, on here. Um, uh, yes, uh, let's talk about this. So, for example, this component and this component and the changes component should uh, share some data between them. For example, the discussions you see here was actually also in on the changes tab. For example, if you add a new discussion here, uh, or if you add a discussion on changes tab, it should be visible also on discussions tab. Um, there is a component also in here I forgot to highlight, which says two of two discussions result. For example, if you create a new discussion, it should be two of three discussions result. And uh, when you resolve that, it should be three or three and three uh, discussions result. So uh, to share the data between those uh, components, we have Vuex in place and uh, we use VX modules, and so this, this can share data between them. For example, if you resolve a discussion in here, uh, it will, we will make sure that it is also, uh, be also shown as result on the changes tab because they share the same data uh, with, with, uh, using a VX store. Yes, so the feature plans of GitLab uh, our first the, and biggest uh, plan is to make it faster. That's what we are trying to do. And uh, we are trying to make it reusable um, with the components I just showed you. Um, we are creating a design system called GitLab UI, which will be at the language of the UI, and we will uh, reuse that in, on, on the different parts of GitLab. Uh, we are trying to uh, build Toolings to optimize workflows and automate things. 
like because automating uh, is something really important. Let's uh, say that if you uh, if you build a tool which will allow you allow one developer, let's say, uh, ten minutes a day, uh, and then like like uh, with, with that scale, going that scale, uh, three hundred developers or three hundred members of a team would be would be a lot of time to uh, save. Uh, and also, yeah, we are hiring, uh, so we are plan to uh, expand our front end team. So questions? I think you can find me outside. Uh, I thank you. That was it. <laughs> <laughs>